So actually, like I spoke about something similar a couple of like couple of months back. So I didn't want to do the same thing again. So I decided to diversify a little and um, speak about my my general setup as, as to like how I use my computer and stuff like that. So the link for the slides is down below. Um, I'm going to link to certain software that you might find um, interesting or useful. So um, if you find find it useful, then um, go ahead and like uh, get the slides, I guess. Yeah, so um, I've been thinking about like productivity for a long time. So this is actually from archive.org. I, I hit the URL because I'm ashamed. Uh, so this is from 2014. So this is like my like fire journey, I guess, into like tweaking my computer and getting it like to be a more productive machine, I guess. Um, so it's gonna be very opinionated, um, and like the stuff I explain might not work for you. So your mileage, your mileage will vary, uh, yeah. So I'm just gonna explain like the three broad goals I try to achieve with my machine. So the first thing is speed. I don't want to launch something and have to wait like a couple of minutes to like get started. So that kind of like rules out like atom already or something. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So um, like the second is simplicity. So I choose software that's like minimal. It's gonna do the stuff that I want and nothing more basically. And the third, I guess, is extensibility. So let's say I want to do uh, something that um, my machine doesn't currently support. I can either write it or like like find something simple to kind of get that functionality. Yeah. So I'm gonna start with something I hope that is not so controversial. Uh, <laughs> um, so like I think this like the current like my in my opinion like the ranking between like the various operating systems. So I like Windows is okay. Who here uses Windows? Hmm, okay. <laughs> who here uses Mac? Mac. Okay. And then who here uses Linux? Well, there's actually more Linux than Mac. Interesting. <laughs> okay, so 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 not many people against my opinion over here. So I don't explain it so much. So I'm just gonna go through like um some of the various Linux distributions that I've tried and some of the stuff that I've noticed. So um the I think the more common ones include uh, Ubuntu, Debian, and Fedora. So um, the, the pros is that they are quite easy to install. Typically, they come with like a GUI installer. Um, they also have a relatively large community. So um, software um, are usually like pre-built for distribution. So for example, like TensorFlow um, works with, with Ubuntu. It's distributed with, um, it's built, like the binaries are built for Ubuntu. Um, and then uh, in some situations, like uh, when you're deploying stuff on your servers, um, these distributions are generally closer to like the VM deployment environment. So mostly Debian actually, like I hope people use Debian and not Ubuntu. And yeah, it's, it's, it's also more stable. But like the issue I faced with that is like package management in general was like super, super painful. So like for example, for Ubuntu, um, you have to like, you have to add PPAs and then you run sudo and get update and it takes like maybe three minutes. No, sudo, yeah, sudo, I don't know which one, but you have to like update the PPAs then install it. And like the, the whole thing takes like five minutes or something. It's really long. And then um, for me, I, I feel that these distributions come with a lot of things that I don't use. So it ships with like, like just like weird stuff that I don't use. And, and it's very bloated. And like my, my, my PC at home used to have only 64 gigabytes of, like my hard disk was 64 gigabytes. So yes. it couldn't, like, it couldn't like, yeah. So I moved on to um, Arc, Arc and the one below is Manjaro, which is like a variant of Arc. The good thing about Arc is that there's a large community and that it comes very bare. So like when you boot it up, um, you generally only have like a TUI and then you install stuff that you want. Uh, I find the package management in Arc a lot better than in the previous distributions. In this case, uh, pa uh, like package updates are really quick and you also have a large user contrib package repo called the AUR. What does it stand for? Arc user repository. Yeah, Arc, Arc user repository and yeah, stuff like that. And like installing Arc was a really good learning experience. I learned a lot about Linux just by installing Arc. The only problem I had with this was that like things can break. So like the, um, usually I just run uh, sudo pacman dash syu, which is basically updating like my my packages, and, which includes the Linux kernel sometimes. And then my whole my whole system breaks, and I can't boot back in anymore. So <laughs> so that that that's not a very productive thing to do, I guess. So I decided to find something else. Yeah. So actually, like the meme, the meme people in this room will realize that like this meme is like missing a frame, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I realized. So I found this like operating system called NixOS. So NixOS um is actually not very new. It's been around since like sometime like in two thousand three, 
and then it gained more popularity in 2014. So the thing about NixOS is that it's also a largish community, and then um, the the way it operates is very different from what you're normally used to, and I guess I'll show it in a while. The thing the thing we get is like atomic upgrades and like reproducible builds, some some things things that like Docker provides, I guess. And then you can I, I'll just demonstrate all of this in a while. The only problems I faced was that installation is hard. You actually have to learn a whole new language to actually use the system. So that's a pretty steep learning curve. Uh, the CI is not designed by like designers, you know, so it's like kind of bad also. Yeah, but once you start using Nix, um, I think you'll grow to love it. So I, I, I'll just sh um, show some s stuff about Nix. Um, oh yeah, just last week, I so this is an article from LWN, which is like a general newsletter for about Linux stuff. So um, Linux actually merged a commit um, that uh, there was a regression in Linux kernel, Linux kernel 4.20.8, and some versions of 5.0. And I run my system on Linux datas. So when I upgraded to this kernel, my whole system like broke. But because it's NixOS, it's okay. So I'll just explain briefly like what happened. So NixOS um, depends on very long shebangs. So um, anyone not clear what shebangs are? Okay, so um, I guess I could just do it here. So typically, when you when you write a script, right, uh, you do something like oh, uh, user bin bash. And then you do stuff like that. So the, the, the thing up here is a shebang. So it, it tells a script like, like what, what program should be running this thing. So let's say you, you actually need Python, then you do maybe like uh, and Python, stuff like that. And then you just write your Python code down here. Yeah. Um, which one was it? Yeah, so in the Linux kernel, they, um, they actually set a fixed length for the shebang, which is 128 bytes. And NixOS depends on super long shebangs. So for example, this like shebang down here, maybe you can't see it, but it's definitely more than 128 bytes. La. So what happens is that uh, the Linux kernel truncates it. And this is actually okay for Perl scripts because Perl detects this truncation and then they interpret the whole shebang anyway. So <laughs> like, and then NixOS depend on the behavior and then, um, and then like they, they merge the regression to the kernel and everything broke. La. But then, it's okay because it's NixOS. So, like, what happens here is that um, every time I change my config, I I build a new generation of my uh, operating system. And what you hear, what you see here is like my bootloader. So um, I'm not sure you can see, but like this is like the different generations. It tells me like uh, what Linux kernel version I have, uh, what Git hash was it that I built it with, and so on. So the the latest one broke, and then I just need to boot into O1, and everything's fine. Yeah. Uh, well, this is even smaller. So this is uh, a um, graph of the number of packages in a repo. So the AUR is, is, is current oh, wow. The AUR is the largest, but Nix packages is, has the largest number of fresh repos and it's just slightly behind the AUR. So that's, that's an indication of like how big the community is. And like, let's say a package, um, let's say you really want a package, like the probability of you finding the package in a repo. So I guess I'll show some demos about thing. So um, the entirety of my operating system configuration is found in a Git repo. So let's show some logs, I guess. Yeah, so uh, every time I want to upgrade something in my system, uh, I change some files and uh, rebuild the configuration. So let's say, uh, it's Julius here. It's not here. <laughs> so, um, who here uses Luminous to download files? Nobody yet. Okay. Uh, Luminous is this like new NUS thing. For those not in NUS, um, it's a new system that NUS wants to move to that nobody actually wants to move to. <laughs> uh, so, uh, So this is an example of a Nix derivation. So this is um, the derivation that specifies how um, I want to build this um, F-Luminous binary that our good friend Julia here wrote to download files from Luminous. 
So Nix, um, Nix is a couple of things. The first thing is it's a language. So this, you, um, this is actually code in the Nix language, right? Nix is also a package manager, so it's, it's quite confusing. And then, uh, yeah, so this is a expression for um, updating the Rust package, I guess. So um, all, all packages are, sp are specified as derivations like this. And uh, he pushed a new commit recently, so I can go and update it. So I, I fetched the latest revision in that git repo and the, the SHA of that git repo changed also. So once I have this change, I can go ahead over here. Oh. And rebuild my config. And then we'll go ahead and fetch a new git repo and, and rebuild the Rust binary. So I push these changes up to GitHub and I have a couple of machines. So every time like I, my operating system, my environment on both my desktop and my laptop is exactly the same. Yeah. So it goes ahead and does a couple of things, which I guess I'll explain in a while. So, so yeah, here it's fetching the new, um, the new source code for that Rust um, binary and, and builds build it using Rust-C. 1.3.1.0. 1 I guess I can cancel this. So how does Nix work? Um, so Nix has this um, store, which is basically like a bunch of files, a um, uh, bunch of derivations and folders. So let me show you what uh, maybe like a derivation looks like. Where's my curve? I can't see my mouse. Uh, or maybe let's see this one. So it's basically like a specification on how the package needs to be built. Yeah. So maybe this one has no built inputs and what the configuration flags and so on. So actually a package is entirely like contained. So this is a, like a specification of what the entire package is. And basically all packages live in the Nix store. So if I check, um, user bin, there's only like env here. Okay, I can see it. Yeah, and everything else in the user path is a symlink to something in the next store. So let's say uh, which as a f. This, this is a symlink to something in the next store, for example. Yeah, so every time you rebuild a system, if a package changes, then new symlinks will be formed. And that's how the atomic upgrades are being done. Yeah. So um, how do you use this um, like in general? Like let's say I'm working on a project. Uh, so you, you can just specify the project de dependencies over here. So the first line imports uh, Nix packages, which is a repo I have locally that, that contains like all the packages in the Nix, pack Nix packages repository. And I'm saying that in this shell, I want Python 3 inside as well as Netcat. And then if you're doing Python development, maybe you want um, some tooling like YAPF and uh, maybe a language server for that project. And then you just run the Nix, Nix shell in there. So uh, let me go to that repo. Uh, CS215. Yeah. So if I run Netcat here, it actually does, it doesn't exist, right? But if I, if I go into a Nix shell and then I run Netcat, now it exists. So you can use it in, in like multiple ways. So for example, there's another tool to download files from IVLE, which is another system that NUS uses. Uh, oh shit. So let me, uh, so here, I changed the shebang. Oh, can you all see? Yeah, I changed the shebang to use Nix shell and specify that I need Python 3 as well as some Python 3 packages. And now, even though I don't have like Python inside um, uh, in my user path, I can still run the file. Or then, like if I, because I collect garbage, so it deletes them sometimes. So now it's fetching Python. And then after that, it will run my, 
run my program. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Nix is a build tool for like most languages. So there's very good Python support, Rust support, um, or Camel support even. Like they just like a lot uh, support for like almost all uh, projects, I guess. Yeah. So I use Nix um, to do like my uh, project management as well. So um, in any there's a course called a CS three two three where you have to write like a static static code analyzer. I guess something like Sorbet. Um, and we do it in C++. So, uh, so this is what it looks like. So I set my standard M to use Clang, and then I specify. So we have like, we need a Qt dependency over here. So I use like Qt five at CMake as well as some tools that that we might have to use. Yeah. Then I um, go to that folder. And I run Nick Shell. I just collected garbage recently as so. well. So you can see over here, right, it's actually downloading two versions of Clang. So what this means is that maybe um, packages um, that are required require different versions of Clang. And it's actually very tricky for package managers to handle. So um, the example I usually quote is that, like, let's say um, a certain Ruby gem requires a different version of like OpenSSL. How are you going to specify that in in your in your uh, repo? Usually, what they do is they, ju they just call like they just call um, Open like maybe, maybe Perl for example. Like you just call Perl, but then that that refers to the Perl in the user path, and you can't specify like which Perl you want. Whereas over here, everything is um, enclosed, so like it just works lah. Yeah. Okay. Did I close it? So the other thing is that you can you can do cool stuff like build Docker containers with Nix. So I believe that um, Docker got their abstractions wrong. So you typically you have like a a typical Docker file looks like this. You do like a from from Ubuntu colon something, and then you do. Uh, run sudo app get update and then you do a bunch of stuff later on. Let's say a layer all the way on the top changes. What Docker has to do is it has to rebuild every single layer that that that's above, like that's below the the layer that changed, right? But that I I think that's not true. I mean, like dependencies are actually like layer. I mean, they're, they're graphs. They're not layers. So let's say um, something over here changed, but but shouldn't affect the below layers. That that layer shouldn't have to rebuild, right? So Nix now also allows you to create like optimized multi-layer Docker Docker images, and I do that for the same project CH three two one three two three, and I guess I show the Docker Docker. So this is it. All I do is I'm saying build an image with Clang, CMake, and Bash, right? And that resulted in in the size. With a, with a Docker container with a lot less layers and with a lot smaller size. And the inter interesting thing about this is that I know that the project compiles and it works on my machine. I also now know that it definitely works in the Docker container because, I mean, it's exactly the same. Like, the Docker container contains exactly the same version of Clang or whatever dependencies I require inside it. So I use this Docker container to run um, my CI stuff on GitLab because it's on a private repo and like GitLab gives you free CI minutes per month. Yeah. So the other difference between um, NixOS and um, Arc is that like contributions um, to the packages uh, in in the AUR are, are usually done by the maintainers themselves. Whereas in NixOS, um, it's actually a public GitHub repo where you if you find something wrong, you can change it and you can fix it. So these shows like I, I made a couple of uh, fixes to some of the packages in NixOS. Um, they generally get merged within two to three days, and like they do quite a bit of code review. So like, one one package has like sixteen comments like that. So it's a, it's a chance to to learn about Nix and also to contribute back to the community, which is nice. Yeah. So that's that's about the OS. Um, do you have any questions about Nix OS at all at this point? Yeah. Seems to me like you said, is it source based? Is it halfway source? 
what do you mean by source base? Gen 2. Um, I don't think there's like, there are, no, there are no OSs that are similar to NixOS. The only one that's similar is Gal, um, GUIX, G-U-I-X, and that's written. So NixOS is written in the Nix language and um, GUIX is written in the Gal scheme language. But that, that what? Oh yeah, so, right. Um, so everything is compiled from source. The thing is that Nix, stuff on Nix packages actually goes through a build farm and then um, it gets stored in this location like cache.nix.org. So every time you make, some, make uh, changes to the Nix packages repo and, and it gets pushed online, it gets rebuilt. So let's say um, your derivation, like your source code over here is exactly the same as the source code that the build farm used to do it. Um, you will figure out a, a cryptographic hash. So this is the hash of that derivation. And if it's exactly the same, what you can do is you can just download it from the build farm. Because you know that everything that, that this package has is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a closure, like it's, how do I explain it? Yeah, basic, basically, like if it's, if it's exactly the same, you can just down, download it from the binary cache. So you don't actually have to compile it yourself. Yeah. Does that answer your question? But if it doesn't match, then you can compile it. Yeah, if it doesn't match, if it doesn't match, then you'll download the dependencies you need to compile it, and then you'll compile it on your machine. Yeah. So that's usually what happens when you want to contribute back to Nix packages. You have to compile it on your machine, and that's the cool thing because if it if it compiles on your machine in NixOS, it it definitely means that it compiles on other people's machine as well because like everything is enclosed inside that that derivation. So uh, moving on from um, NixOS, um, so this is a like somewhat in inaccurate picture of like um, I, I don't know what you call this. Like so, uh, typically when you when you install an operating system uh, like Ubuntu, you it comes with a desktop environment, a desktop manager. So Ubuntu now comes with uh, let's say GNOME, I think they replace they replace um, Unity. You can also install KDE, XFC, and stuff like that. So what I find is that all these desktop managers, they actually do a lot of things that you don't really need. And, and therefore, it's like quite bloated. And the only, the only good thing about it is that it's convenient to install. Um, so this is like the kind of the lowdown. Um, so most of it runs on X. Unless you're a super hipster, you probably won't be running Wayland. Um, and then most of the stuff you need actually comes from a window manager. And I think like something right on top of X something very light is the right amount of power and customizability. So there's a bunch of um, tiling window managers that you can try. So I put some stuff from um, r slash Unix pawn. It's like a, it's a Reddit sub sh by people who want to showcase like beautiful Unix desktops. And then I looked at it and I think the quality kind of went down. But yeah. Um, so I actually get this one of the examples of a window manager. And this guy is just showcasing like how he lays out his like stuff, which I think is a bit overkill for sure. And then there's some more here and there. So I tried a couple. Um, the one that I'm currently using is Red Poison. Um, Red Poison is basically, um, it's, a, it's related to the mouse. Like, it's just saying that um, you want to kill the mouse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm using a Tauling window manager, I, and I can showcase it in a while. If you're using a Mac, um, you're out of luck. Um, the only stuff you can use is hammer spoon and spectacle. If you're really into um, configuring your your window manager in Mac, you should go with hammer spoon because you can code stuff in Lua and make it do funky things. Yeah. So um, in general, when I when I work on stuff, I only tend to use a full screen thing or like a side by side thing over here. So this is an example of what tiling managers do. La. Yeah. Um, as you can see, um, I don't have any task bars or anything. I find them like not very useful. Uh, first of all, they take up very precious um, screen real estate. And then um, they also do a lot of like polling. So let's say your, your clock up here, you have a clock up here, it has to run stuff every second to update that thing over there, which is annoying. What? It's negligible, but my PC used to be very bad, so <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So all these get bound to a key. So if if you use T marks, it's basically like T marks for your entire um, environment, I guess. So I I highly suggest um, trying out a tiling window manager. I know it might not be for everyone, but for me, I think it's one of the biggest improvements that of for productivity that I got. And then there's shell. So who here, who here uses Bash? Who here uses Z shell? Z shell. Who here uses Fish? Yes, Fish. <laughs> <laughs> so honestly, I don't have like a very strong opinion as to which shell to use. Um, I use Fish because it, it comes with a lot of nice things by default. And I also have to maintain a couple of stuff that I wrote a while ago. But yeah, it really doesn't matter what shell you use. Um, I tend to recommend against Z shell because it's slow, but I'm not sure if that's still the case anymore. Yeah, Fish is generally the fastest shell. It's just that it's not POSIX compliant. So if you write certain shell scripts, then you might not be able to run it, and you might have to fork out to a subprocess in Bash. Um, and then I, there's a special mention to Mosh, which is a which is a like software you use when connectivity is kind of intermittent. So you can still do stuff and get them in. Uh, when you have shitty internet, uh, basically. Um, so, um, how many use like a completely bare like terminal, like completely bare? Okay. So I kind of recommend people to know your terminal key bindings. So who here knows all, like the the GNU read line key bindings? No read line. Yeah. So let me just. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's say I type a really long thing here, right? Um, control A goes to the front of the line. Control E goes to the end of the line. Um, meta B goes backwards. Meta F goes back, um, goes forwardwards. Control K kills the thing. Control Y yanks it. There's like a ton of key bindings. The good thing is if you if you use Emacs, you probably already know it. Yeah, but like it, it really helps to type code a lot faster, I mean like correct your command lines a lot faster. Especially if you're doing data science where like a lot of your Python scripts come with like arguments you pass in. Um, this this really saves a lot of time. Yeah. Control L clears the screen. Um, Control R does a reverse I search. So this searches for stuff you ran before in your um, history. Mm. Well I'm in the next shell so it doesn't show. So other things you, you might want to know is like grep. So you use grep to search for stuff. Um, there are replacements for grep. Um, so there's the silver searcher AG, and there's rip grep RG, which is like the fastest version of grep you can find now. Um, so RG by, so by itself is not very useful, but you can combine it with um, certain things, which I'm, I'll show later, I guess. And also find, um, which um, basically finds files. Um, your, your system actually has an index of all the file, like most of the files in your system. So you, you can use stuff like find or locate to look them up. So for example, um, over here, I use a combination of find and FZF um, to go to certain directories. So this this is a list of directories. Um, oh, I should. So maybe I want to go to my um, 2105 assignment, for example, or whatever. So it does a fuzzy search and it changes to that directory, rather than me having to CD manually into each of them, stuff like that. Then con um, history as well, like basically just shows stuff that I've run before on my terminal. Yep. So if you don't use um, a fuzzy file finder, maybe you should give it a try. Yeah. So launchers, yeah. Um, so Mac has this thing called Alfred. Um, it's non-free, so it doesn't really fit to the productivity with free software title. But there's a free version of Alfred. Um, you just can't do much customizations with it. Whereas if you use Linux, um, you, should, you should look at something like Rofi. So I, I really suggest to abuse the launcher. So use it to like launch programs. So for example, um, here you just launch like Slack, whatever, Emacs, whatever. And then find files. So let's say I want to open a particular PDF I have. It's also bound to another key binding in my window manager. So here, uh, maybe like the textbook. Uh, yeah. And for example, instead of going op opening Finder and like clicking through my folders to find the thing, um, choosing my active window not really uh, applicable to people who don't use window managers. So I won't show it. A few passwords. So 
there are a couple of um, password managers which I highly suggest people use. Actually, I only suggest people use one, but I recommend people to use password managers in general. <laughs> so the, the one that I use is called Pass. It's a very simple command line utility that um, encrypts your password using GPG, basically. So I can just show it here. And then everything is um, in, in a Git repo, so you can do pass git pull and stuff like that. And then you push it somewhere you think it's safe. So it's, on, it's in a private repo in GitHub, which is not very safe. But <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's say uh, I want to log into IBLE. All to do is to invoke another key, bind key binding on my PC. So this one, auto type, and then it types it out. It goes in, yeah. So stuff like that. So that's, that's actually a utility called Rofi Pass, which is part of, not part of Rofi, but like an extension to Rofi. Um, window. Yeah. Folder navigation. So have you, have you all heard of like Ranger or NNN? Nobody. Uh, I don't use either of those, but I think like um, text-based um, folder, folder and file management is very powerful. I guess I can show an example in Direct, but maybe later on. Because Direct is the one that I use, but it comes with Emacs, so. And email consumption. Yeah, how many of you like hate the new Gmail interface? One, one only? I'm surprised. Because like, no, no one uses Gmail. Wait, what? Okay, interesting. Yeah, so um, what I do is I actually download mail locally using this tool called MBSync, and it creates an index on my system. So for example, over here, I can search for it. Like, I can do a full text search across all my mail in, in my system. I can do a search by tag. And like this output on its own is not very useful, but there are um, front ends for, for that. So like, let's say here, this, this is my mail. Uh. So, <laughs> I can search for stuff like maybe like a recent, our recently concluded um, hack and roll. It's like a full text search across all my email, and it's very fast. And yeah, so I think I think using uh, MB Sync and not much also improved my workflow, which you won't see until I show stuff later at the end. So I guess that will have to wait. Okay, Vim and Emacs. <laughs> uh, so who uses Vim? And Emacs. Well, one. Okay. Anything but Vim and Emacs. VS Code. VS Code. Okay. <coughs> so, um, I used Vim for about four years. Um, and then I switched over to Emacs. I have been using Emacs almost exclu exclusively for three years. And my opinion is that Emacs is better. But then I, I could be wrong. Now. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to give an analogy that's not soup. <laughs> so, um, so in NUS, okay, in NUS, like there's this new initiative where um, this new Grab initiative where you have this like scooter thing where you can drive around now. Um, so some people use it as an alternative alternative to get around. So I think Vim is something like this scooter. Um, <laughs> it, you can't really can't like you're kind of limited by, by the scooter. So for example, this scooter cannot go up the slope in computing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, to, to me, to me that there's like a ceiling as to like how powerful Vim can get. Um, actually not really, because Vim script is Turing complete. And, but it's just, it's just like a terrible language to make extensions in. So whereas Emacs is kind of like a bus um, <laughs> in, that, in that like, it's more, it's more powerful, uh, but it's also kind of like, not great. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, see, the, the old name of, the old acronym of Emacs, like some people used to call it eight megabytes and constantly swapping. <laughs> but, but I don't think that's true now. Like Emacs was built in an era where like memory was super precious. And then it was, it was just not a software for its time, I guess. And then now, now it's, I, it launches instantly, see? There. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so I, I think like the bus thing is not super accurate, so I decided to change it a little. So I think it's more like a like a proton car, you know, like it comes like kind of lousy, but then you can start replacing parts in it and, and it becomes super powerful. So people actually use stuff like that for like racing, which is nice. 
So an example of like how extensible Emacs is. So when I when I was a intern at Carousel, I used to deal a lot with the Google Cloud platform. So we had to browse like the, the buckets inside Google Cloud. And then every time you click on a thing here, you have to refresh a page and load like new stuff. And then it's it, it grows like the time taken to load it is actually ex like related to the number of files inside that directory, which is which is terrible. Uh. So I wrote something in just hundred lines of Emacs list that lets me like browse a cache version of like um well, small. So this is the same Google Cloud thing, just that now it's like instant, and I can preview files and stuff like that. <coughs> Which is, which is cool. I mean, I don't think you could do it in 100 lines of Vim, or someone can challenge me and try to do it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. You also can, like, b basically, like, e like, you can do everything in Emacs, and that's what I try to do. Um, so this is another example of me asking for a particular feature and it getting implemented within just a few lines, in, like, by someone in a day. Yeah. So project management. Um, so there's this thing called DERMF, which I, which I use. Um, but I use it in, um, concurrently with Nix. So I'm just going to show you what it does. So let me. So how do you com you configure the .env by creating a .envrc file? Whoa. So um, the .env lets you um, set things like environment variables for specific projects, or um, let's say set up a virtual env environment. So let's say you're using Python and you want to set up a virtual env environment, it's just basically like lay out Python, and that's it. Or you want to maybe set um, specific um, secret keys, for example, for your project, you just do like export x equals to one or something. Yeah. And then you time for allow. And every time you enter this folder, um you get that key, you get that particular key set. So if I echo X, it should be there. Oh. It's one la. Yeah. So you can do really funky stuff with this. Um so for example um what I use is Nix. So if I go to um Maybe my yeah. So over here, all I have inside my mfrc is this thing called use use nix. It's just one line use nix, and then it basically loads my nix shell environment. So now I have netcat available. At, yeah. Um, so um, the MF is language agnostic. It works across like any kind of project. So it has bindings for Python, Rust, and so on. So I do suggest um, looking it up. Yeah. Uh, and then also like abuse, read, grab, find, and fuzzy file finder. If you're using Emacs, do use like project ma specific project management tools like Projectile and. I guess I can show a bit of this if you guys are interested later on. And then finally, um, org mode. So how many of you heard of org mode? One, two, three, four. Okay. That's a very small amount, I guess. Um, so org mode is like, it's, it's a bit like markdown. I said that because it's done in Emacs, um, people build a lot of extensions around it. So let me just give an example of an org file. So you create you this like a header. So hello. You can have subheaders and headers and so on. It's it's like markdown except like your hash is replaced replaced with a star. La. And then you, you have stuff like um, inline LaTeX, so x equals to one. You can preview that. And so on, yeah. So it's basically marked down with, with some more stuff. So it, it's also um, it's also a uh, to do like it was built around this idea called getting things done, which is like a system 
by David Allen, which I can we can which I will go through my workflow a bit in a bit. But yes, like stuff like to dos, um, you can schedule deadlines for something. So maybe this is due Saturday. Schedule stuff. Um, you can do like basically a bunch of stuff. Uh. Yeah. So there's there's a whole talk on how you use it to um, build a second brain. Um, this was this talk is in November 2018, so it's a bit after I started using it. So my the, my the way I do it is slightly different from it. So if you're interested, you can look at the YouTube video. So I use it for life management. So um, like I mentioned, uh, getting things done getting things done is like a workflow um, proposed by David Allen to help you get things done. <laughs> um, interestingly, I think this this like productivity industry, uh, people like try to monetize it so you don't have a lot of free software that can help you do it. So the best I can think of is Todoist, which is unfree. Um, oh. OmniFocus, which is for Mac, which is good, but it's also unfree. Uh, remember the Milk is a very old Linux application that nobody uses anymore. And then there's Ogmo and OgAgenda, which I'll show now, I guess. So this is like, can I zoom in? So this is the view I get within Emacs every day, I guess. So I was up at 4.35. Or, uh, so over here, I can see my daily itinerary. So I have like an AM lecture followed by a 10 AM tutorial and so on. And then I also clock in like certain tasks. So I know that over here, I did my assignment, for example. Yeah, so I get, I get an overview basically on like stuff that I have to do. And then every time I just, every time I need to, bit, like if I don't write something down, I, I forget. So um, this basically contains everything that I need to do at any point in time. And I just pick stuff based on like urgency. So for example, if this is due in three days, I might start on it soon. So it also has support for habits. So clearly I don't, I don't do my, like my habits are quite bad. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, so when I, when I find new stuff to do, I'll just capture it. So I press C and then I'll type like, um, clean my room. <laughs> yes. So it goes into my inbox. And then uh, after I'm done capturing everything, I'll do a, a quick refile. So I press R and then oh, read. So this one is reading my textbook, which is actually already done, but I forgot to refile. So I set where I can do it, which is home and school. Um, give it a priority uh, and effort. So this is an effort estimate, like how long I think I'll take to do that particular task. So maybe one hour. And then refile it to the correct project. And then basically do this for like every single thing in my inbox. So now I have everything categorized according to that particular project. So in this case, my projects are mainly the modules that I'm taking. And I think this system is very useful, especially if you're taking a lot of things. Um, so you can think about like your brain as like a computer, right? And then if you have to keep remembering things, then you're basically using up like precious brain CPU to do that. Whereas if you write everything down, then your brain is free to do like clear thinking. That's, that's like the basic idea, uh, I guess. Yeah. So actually Emacs doesn't come like you, you do have to do a significant amount of um, configuration to get something close to my my setup, but I think it's well worth it. And the whole idea of Emacs is that you can build it around a workflow that suits you. So this this is what suits me, I guess. Mm. So you can do I do things like note taking. So um, if you if you're on a Mac, I recommend using Notational Velocity, which is a very simple like plain text note taking application. Um, whereas I use um, Alt Mode and Dev. So all my notes reside in a directory and are available here. So I do I do quite a bit of reading on AI stuff. I don't know. Um, so let's say let's say uh, I did something on PGMs and then there's there's a key term that I need to look up. So like the separation. So it's basically like a full text search on all my notes. La. Then you bring me to the correct place. So not only that, um, I can export all this stuff into LaTeX, um, whatever. So I can export this to um, HTML, LaTeX, Markdown, and so on. 
so what I do is generally it's a it's a git repo. So every time I um change it, uh, I, I do a commit and I push it up and then uh a publishing platform I use Netlify, so Netlify actually um publishes it. So this is what it looks like. Um whoa. This is, this is what it gets transformed to like online. So I do like revise some of my notes while I'm on the train and stuff like that. So I, I open like my web page on my phone and read it to revise my modules. Yeah. So I think maintaining like a knowledge repo has been very useful for me. And it's a practice that, it's one of the practices that I picked up that I think has one of the biggest impacts on my studying. Mm. Yeah, so publishing with that. And then you can also use Ong mode to prepare um, material. So um, I, I use it to um, write some of my um, like research reports and also to produce slides. So this is one of the slides I produce for um, my research, undergraduate research program. And you can also export to, you can also export nice slides to review JS. So this is an example of one of the slides that my friends my friend produced um, for a tutorial, I guess. Yeah. So all this is done just by typing like plain markdown. Yeah. So I guess in summary, uh, I I find that like using a very simple like plain text system is very powerful. Um, I try to like. I want most of my stuff just a key binding away. So if you use a tiling window manager, it's a good idea to make everything behind a key binding. And if you find something that like, um, you find some blocker in your workflow, if you're using Emacs, you can aggressively automate it and write, write code to fix stuff for you. Yeah. So actually, like my, my configuration is not unique. Um, the Emacs maintainer, uh, John Wigley, also uses Nix and fish and emacs so uh, it's kind of like validation for like my <laughs> configuration so i feel better about myself yeah yeah so i guess that's that's all i wanted to show you all